boogers. Sit back, relax, enjoy the show. You don't even have to take notes. I'm not going to teach you anything. I'm going to teach you new stuff, but I'm not going to teach you anything of, uh, I was going to say a value. Well, that's, well, you're wasting our time. I should refund your tuition. What I'm trying to say, I'm just so excited. <sighs> so what I'm trying to say, calm down, Castle, is this is meant to be an enjoyable, motivational, kind of kick off the last topic for the semester, major topic, which is differential equations and how to solve them numerically. But in, in spending some time introducing this topic, we will not be covering any, any numerical methods per se. I'm just motivating the need for this and where we're going with it. Yikes. But yeah, I'm a little excited because if you've looked ahead, you can see that the first topic is fun with differential equations right there. So I hope you have a side <laughs> of stocks. Oh, you want my stock recommendations. All right. We'll have to save that for another time. Okay, so uh, this will be divided up into several chapters, sections, whatever you want to call them. And the first one is discretization methods for differential equations. But today and part of next Tuesday, we'll just be motivating why this is so important, how much fun it actually is, and how much we can learn from these methods. So introduction. All right, so fun, <laughs> fun with differential equations. Of course, some of you thought I was a little nerdy before, and now you know for sure there's, I've left no doubt that indeed I am a nerd because yes, differential equations are fun. And I will, I endeavor to show you how much fun they can be today. All right, so why differential equations? Well, because these are so essential, so important, so central to our lives as engineers. As you're sitting through, just imagine yourself sitting in any other class. So ME202, 313, 323. I know some of these you haven't taken yet, uh, and so on. 305, and you sit there and you think, OK, what equations have we learned? Where do they come from? How did we derive them? How do we use them? And you realize they're almost all differential equations. So in fact, it's kind of weird when you get to 313 fluid mechanics and one of the first equations you learn about is Bernoulli's equation and there's no derivatives in it. And you think, well, that's kind of weird because it seems like every equation we learn in all of our engineering classes have derivatives in it, which is why, of course, it's called a differential equation because it's an equation with derivatives. And indeed, the vast majority of equations that govern the physics that we're interested in are differential equations. Why is that? Well, because they encapsulate the physical principles that govern our systems. Things like conservation of mass, momentum, and energy are basically the building blocks for almost every one of these equations in some form. It's not always clear and obvious. Sometimes we kind of hide it from you, but at the core, there's something being conserved. And by being conserved, we mean it's not changing. The mass is not changing. The momentum is not changing. The energy is not changing in a first law of thermodynamics sort of sense. So whereas calculus is the mathematics of change, and you're thinking, wait a second, I took three calculus classes. Is that really what it is? Is that all it is? They never said that. That's all it is. Calculus is just the mathematics of change. Something's changing. A function is changing. How is it changing? Oh, I don't know. Let's take the derivative and find the slope. Is it increasing? Is it decreasing? Things like that. Differential equations then govern that change. So differential equations is an extension of the beloved calculus that we learned. So differential equations is governing that change. That change could be in time if it's an unsteady problem, or it could be and or, it could be in space. So it could be X and Y and Z, 
and or it could be a function of time, t. And this governs everything. This, this is not just in your major. It's certainly true for mechanical systems. It's true for electrical systems, chemical systems, biological systems. They all involve things evolving in time and space, changing in time and space. So they're governed by differential equations. Just to throw some up on the board and, and maybe one or two of these will stick for you personally, based on courses that you've taken or interests that you have. So in 305, MMA 305 dynamics, it's all about Newton's second law, right? F equals MA, which we've grown up with. We've been seeing F equals MA ever since high school. F equals MA this, F equals MA that, whether it's the planets orbiting around the sun, whether it's me dropping my, my iPhone on the ground, whether it's me tossing a projectile towards home plate, whatever it is, it's always F equals MA. So that's dynamics, 305. It's conservation of momentum is what that is governing. So they give the equations of motion. You apply F equals MA to various systems of moving objects, which is what you do in dynamics, and you get the equations of motion. So if you remember back in section 352, we had this spring mass problem. We had two masses and three springs. And we derived the governing equations for the two masses using F equals MA, and we got these equations. So that's F equals MA applied to a wibbly wobbly spring mass system. And they are second order because the highest order derivative is two. So we say that they're second order. Are they linear or nonlinear? Anybody? Mumble, mumble. Linear, yeah. They're linear because I have x1s and x2s, but only ever by themselves. There's no x1 squareds. There's no x1s times x2s. There's no signs of x1. So there's no nonlinear terms in here at all. So these are second order linear ordinary differential equations, two of them coupled together to solve for the mass locations as functions of time. Great. And that's what dynamics is over and over again, increasingly complicated systems. In 202, so mechanics of solids, you also derive equations that govern various sorts of things that you care about with, with the structures and solid mechanics. And one of them is the beam deflection equation. So you have a beam, say like this, simply supported say, and you put a load on it. So this would be P of X here, it's a load, and then that causes it to deflect, and that's V of X. So how do you solve for the deflection of the beam? Well, you derive the beam deflection equation, which governs that shape, E and I, those are properties of the material and the shape, Young's modulus and the moment of inertia, P, as I said, is the applied load. P is a function of X. Solve that differential equation. Is it linear or nonlinear? E and I are just constants. P is a known function of X. So first of all, what order is it? It's a second of a second. So it actually makes it a fourth because you have a second derivative of a second derivative. So it's actually fourth order, and that's typical of beam equations. They're usually fourth order. Is it linear or nonlinear? It's linear. Because once again, the dependent variable, you just look at the dependent variable. So V itself, it's just V. There's no V squareds, no signs of Vs. And this is, this is I know this kind of tricks you, right? So it's the second derivative of, the, of something times the second derivative. This is just a constant normally, if this is, well, I shouldn't say normally. If this has a, a cross-sectional area that's a constant, then I is the same. And if the material is homogeneous, then E is the same across the whole length. And so this is a constant and you can take it out and you just have E times I times the fourth derivative of V with respect to X. The way I've written it, 
allows for either the material properties to change along the length, in which case E is a function of X, and or if the shape changes, then I will change as a function of X as well. So the way I've written it, uh, it looks a little more complicated, but still either way, it's just a linear equation. It's just a linear equation. Fluid mechanics, so this is 313. So you take 313 and the equations, the equations that govern all the stuff that you're doing, there's simplified versions of them, but the equations are called the Navier-Stokes equations, not the Navier, it's French, so it always sounds cool, Navier, everything is more beautiful in French, I'm telling you. You listen to two people argue in French and you think it's some sort of romantic interaction, it's amazing. Whereas two old Italian guys having a normal everyday conversation, it sounds like they're arguing. It's just amazing. So French, oh. Okay, so conservation of mass leads to this. Now I've written this in the, what's called vector form. It's kind of the disguised differential form. So this says that the gradient of the velocity the gradient vector dotted with the velocity is equal to zero. So that's conservation of mass. And then we get conservation of momentum, which literally comes from F equals MA. Now, of course, this equation looks very different than these equations, but they're governing the same physics. It's just that fluids can do more things than wibbly wobbly spring masses. So there's a lot more physics contained in here, but still it's all just F equals MA. These terms are the F. This one is pressure force, and this one is viscous force or frictional forces. And the left side is mass times A. Now it's density, rho, so it's mass per unit volume, mass per unit volume times the acceleration. Now, because it's a fluid, whole bunch of fluid particles, the acceleration is much more complicated than just the second derivative of the position with respect to T, as it is for some object, such as a projectile being tossed across the room. But it's the same physics, the same underlying Newton's second law. All right, so this one, this is one of my favorite differential equations because it governs all the stuff I'm interested in from a fluid mechanics, computational fluid mechanics point of view and my research and so on. So I have this, these equations they're wallpapered on my, my walls and my bedroom ceiling. Uh, all of our dishes at home that we use when we have guests, have them in, emblazoned on the plates, the glasses, the silverware. I try not to wear these clothes to work because it's kind of embarrassing. I'm already nerdy enough, so I save them for special occasions, but I do have items and articles of clothing that have these equations embroidered, stitched onto them. So these are my favorite equations. Now I'm not gonna show you because they're PDEs. I'm gonna limit myself today to ordinary differential equations. My three favorite, I won't show you that part of my wardrobe. The three, fa my three favorite ordinary differential equations. Okay, now this, these are PDEs, so I can't show you these. Have to save that for another time. Then uh, 323, again, probably haven't taken yet. But heat transfer, so now conservation of energy comes in. And if you only have conduction, so nothing is moving, then it looks like this. This is the same symbol, del squared. It's called the Laplacian. It's really second derivatives of, in this case, the velocity. V is velocity, P is pressure. And here it's second derivatives of temperature, T. If there's convection, which means there's also movement, so this would be like air or a fluid. So then you get these terms. You say, well, those terms look familiar. They look just like these terms. Well, that's no coincidence. They're there for the same reason. This is the convection of momentum. This is the convection of heat. Oh, oh okay. Same physics, just a different thing being convected. This term looks like this term. Here, it's the diffusion of momentum here, it's the diffusion 
of heat. Just the same thing. So as you pull these together from different areas, different topical subjects and so forth, you start to see how, okay, I start to see some connections between them. All right, so that's just a bunch of classes that you've either taken, are taking, or will be taking. And some of the important governing differential equations that you'll see. Now, I will answer the question for this one. Is this linear or nonlinear? The answer is it's nonlinear because you got the V dot del V. The V, so this is like a V times V. So that's nonlinear. And that causes us all kinds of problems. This, the conduction only form is linear, but the convection form is nonlinear because it's got this V dot del T thingy in there. Okay, there's different ways to classify differential equations. And this is partly why we as engineers get confused about all this because everyone has their classification, their favorite classifications, all of which are in some sense important. But for our purposes, the one that is of primary importance is this distinction. And I'll, I'll get to that in a moment, but let me run through the others. So usually, when we think of this from a mathematical point, the big distinction is, oh, is it an ODE or a PDE? Is it an ordinary differential equation or a partial differential equation? The difference is very simple, and it's actually not really worth taking note of. And that is, it all comes down to the number of independent variables. So an ordinary differential equation only has one independent variable, whereas a partial differential equation has more than one independent variable. Why? Why do we use a different symbol? Here, I use a D for ordinary derivatives. Here, I use a partial for partial derivatives. They're fundamentally the same. There's no difference mathematically. It's just a convention that is used. And in fact, it's kind of unfortunate because it has caused generations of students, myself included, a great deal of confusion, hours of lost sleep, trying to figure out why and when to use a D versus a partial. And finally, you come to the conclusion, they're exactly the same thing. It's just, if there's only one independent variable, then we all agreed at some point in time and history to use a D. If there's more than one, let's use a partial. It'll confuse the bejeebies out of everyone for generations and generations to come. Ha, ha, ha. We're so funny. So ODE versus PDE, not a terribly significant distinction. It's really not that an important of a distinction. The big one for us, and I'll tell you why in a moment, is whether it's a boundary value problem, BVP, or initial value problem, IVP. So what this means is, if you have a boundary value problem, then what's important is what's happening at the boundaries. So you have boundaries to your domain and you have boundary conditions at every point on the domain. So what's the temperature on the boundary? What's the velocity on the boundary and so forth? So those correspond to steady, so time invariant problems, problems that do not depend on time. They're not changing with time. The answer is the answer. IVPs, initial value problems have an initial condition. So now one of the boundaries is t is equal to zero when you start the evolution of this equation. So that's an unsteady problem. It's now time dependent. And you start with what is the behavior at t is equal to zero. And then the equation determines the behavior as it involves in time, evolves in time. So like our heat conduction equation back here, if things do not change with time, if the temperature doesn't change with time, in this case, then partial partial t is zero. Partial partial t is zero. And then for the conduction case, you're just left with del squared t is equal to zero. That's actually Laplace's equation, which is a steady differential, partial differential equation. Same thing here. You have the steady convection diffusion equation. You have convection and diffusion, but if it's not changing with time, then you get a steady solution. It depends on X and Y, but not on T. It's time invariant. 
So that is a big distinction. I'll come back to that in a moment. The other important distinction is whether it's linear or nonlinear, implied by my looking at each of those equations and asking the question, so is it linear or is it nonlinear? Generally, linear things are easier and nonlinear things are harder. That's kind of what we've learned, right? It's a linear equation, whether it's algebraic, differential, generally speaking, it's easier. If it's nonlinear, again, whether algebraic or differential, it's generally harder. Harder to solve, but also more interesting because it can lead to more interesting types of behavior as we'll see in a moment. However, again, for our purposes, we want to develop numerical methods for these differential equations. The most important distinction in terms of what types of methods and how I develop those methods is whether it's a boundary value or initial value problem. They're fundamentally different types of equations governing fundamentally different types of behavior, physical behavior. So our numerical methods will have to reflect that. So we'll look at the, both of those separately. Now, if it's a linear versus nonlinear boundary value problem, okay, that'll have some important consequences, but not the most important consequence, which is the basic approach to the solution. Same thing with IVP. You can have linear, nonlinear IVPs. And again, whether it's linear or nonlinear will make a difference, but the basic fundamental approach will be the same as if it's an initial value problem. Same thing with ODEs and PDEs. We've kind of been trained to think that PDEs are harder than ODEs because in your in math 252, you learn primarily about ODEs, right? You spend a lot of time on that. And at the very end of the semester, they squeeze in some stuff about PDEs, maybe if we have time. And then you get this image, oh, they must be way harder. Yeah, they're a little harder, but they're only harder because there's more independent variables, that's all. So rather than just a function of X, well, now it's a function of X and Y or X and T. So yeah, it's a little harder, but it's not fundamentally a different type of problem. So from the point of view of developing algorithms to solve these approximately using numerical methods, by far the most important distinction is whether it's boundary value or initial value problem, which you'll see that in how we discuss this later. All right, now, so we've seen these equations all over the place. In different, in different classes. Sometimes we almost apologize for them. Oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to show you that horrible looking differential equation. I didn't want to scare you today. We, we're kind of apologetic about it. But the reality is, this is our life. As engineers and scientists, most of the interesting things that we care about are governed by differential equations. So we can't avoid them. Now, if we don't have numerical methods, which up until this point we haven't had, you're limited to very specific types of solutions for very specific types of problems. So in the grand scheme of things, in terms of engineering problems that you'd like to be able to solve these equations for, and if you look at what you can actually solve in what's called closed form or exact solution form, it's like, whoa, I spent a lot of time in that math 252 class and it turns out I really can't do much. It was a lot of work. I paid a lot of not necessarily money for it, although that too, but put a lot of sweat and tears into that. And I feel like I've shortened my life a little bit. And as it turns out, I can't really solve many interesting practical problems with the methods that I learned. There's a whole lot out there is my point. And again, we kind of hide that from you in the, in your other classes, because we don't want to scare you. We don't want you to think that you're not learning anything in those classes. 313 is my favorite because I teach that class a lot. I love it. It's my life. Again, the equations are all over my house. I even had them stenciled on my car so all the public can see as I'm driving down the road. You all know I'm kidding, right? Are you? Yeah, I just, I, I, I'm not sure why, but I kind of felt the need. I don't know if it's the mass but I'm getting these blank stares like, is he serious? I don't think he is, but he is kind of strange. So he might be, I mean, he talks about his wife. And so, I mean, I can't imagine she would allow this. 
anyway, so it's, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Oh my God. Mostly I'm kidding. All right. So, oh. so the point being in science, oh, I was 313. Okay. So 313, you spend about a week, two classes at least, deriving these horrible Navier Stokes equations. And then you spend maybe one day learning how to solve them. You know why you only spend one day? Because that's about all you can do to find exact solutions. And if has any is anybody in 313 or, or you've taken 313? Yeah. So this it's actually kind of fun, right? You get these big nasty Navier Stokes equations. And then you say, okay, let's solve these equations. Remember Coet flow? Does that sound familiar? Okay, so Coet flow. I have a channel, I have two parallel plates, and I say, okay, well, what's true about that flow? And all of a sudden, the professor's up there just lopping off terms, whole terms from the equation, left and right. Whole equations get obliterated. And all of a sudden, you're left with a little ordinary differential equation. So, wait, 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 slow down. What just happened? It, it looked like a train wreck, literally. You start with these nasty equations, you said how oh, they're PDEs and they're nonlinear and they're hard to solve. And all of a sudden, all the terms are gone. And you say, oh, here's the equation that governs quet flow or pipe flow, or there's only a handful of ones that you can actually solve it for. And that's the whole point. That's the point I'm trying to make. So interesting flows that we as engineers care about, you can't get an exact solution. It's only these little toy flows that you can get an exact solution because you make all kinds of simplifications. And that's why all those terms are all of a sudden magically going away. All right, so differential equations are all over the place, number one. And very, there are very few cases where we can actually solve them exactly for practical problems of interest. All you have to do is make the geometry more complicated than two parallel plates of infinite extent in all directions or a long straight pipe of infinite length, anything more complicated than that, you gotta solve numerically. Now we didn't do that in 313. Well, yeah, it wasn't a numerical methods class. They, they, and maybe they said, or maybe they didn't say, well, you gotta wait for 350 to get a taste for how that's done. So all of that to say, this is absolutely an essential tool in our toolbox as engineers. The vast majority of solutions for real, and by real, I mean practical engineering applications is gonna to have to be done numerically. You're not gonna be able to do it exactly. And that's why we spend so little time on it in some of these classes because it's so unusual and rare. So we need to be able to, it's absolutely essential to be able to solve these numerically. And that's really, in some sense, everything we've been doing, not everything, but a lot of things we've been doing in this class have kind of been leading up to this. So all that talk about linear systems of equations at the very beginning, well, what's the most prevalent, most ubiquitous example of where those linear systems of algebraic equations, where they come from? Guess what? They come from discretization of differential equations. Now we did some other interesting things with them fine, but the by far the biggest application for us as engineers is solving differential equations. And so this is going to just completely open up the barn door in terms of the types of problems we can solve. Now there's no limits, no limits on what we can solve, both in the context of ordinary partial differential equations. The sacrifice we have to make, of course, is we're not getting exact solutions. They're approximate solutions. But that's the, the trade-off. You want to solve those equations for that problem? All right, be my guest. Bang your head against the wall. See if you can get an exact solution. Oh, you can't? Oh, you want to solve it numerically? OK, fine. Well, it has to be approximate. And that's what you'll see as we go through this. What I want to do today is before I talk about how to do these numerical solutions, I wanna talk about and give you many, several examples of what kinds of behaviors these solutions can exhibit. So in other words, before I talk about how the methods and the algorithms, 
we need to kind of have a, a library of possible behaviors in our minds. So these are the types of things that I need to be able to solve, approximately, yes, but solve in real systems of equations, real physical problems. So what I'm going to do is I'm not, I've, I've actually limited myself because this could go on the rest of the semester because there's lots of fun equations. So I've limited myself to just ODEs, no PDEs at all for now. And I'm going to talk about three of my favorite ODEs. Uh, one of which you've sort of seen a version of, the other two you've never seen before. And again, the spirit of this is I want to show you that the equations give you a little physical sense for where they come from, but primarily focus on the types of solutions that they can exhibit, because those are the sorts of things we need to be able to capture in our numerical methods. So the first one is a forced pendulum. It's a real simple geometry, very simple system, but it leads to a very interesting equation with extremely interesting behaviors. So we all know the simple pendulum. The simple pendulum, you just have a mass hanging from a pendulum of length L, and this wibble wobbles back and forth. And the governing equation for that is super simple. If, if u of t is that position, we usually say theta of t, but if we linearize so that it just captures the, uh, the motion near the vertical, then that's just u double dot plus g over l. g is acceleration down. Yeah, if we don't linearize, then it's sine theta, sine u, sorry, is equal to zero. So that's the simple pendulum. And you probably have seen that in some physics class or dynamics class at some point, fine. It's, uh, it's fun to play with, but nothing terribly exciting happens. All you can do is change the length of this, change the mass, which actually turns out not to have any effect. You can change the initial conditions. So woo, let's make it go start farther out, not so far, and see what difference it makes. But all it does is it wobbles back and forth for all time. Not terribly exciting. Well, let's make things a little more exciting. So here's that same geometry, but now we're going to add forcing to the pivot point. So we're now going to force it vertically up and down with an amplitude A and a frequency omega. So A cosine omega T. So that's, that's a prescribed forcing that we're imposing on this pivot point. It's going up and down A cosine omega T. Frequency omega, amplitude A. And what we want to do is look at what difference does that make? So the simple pendulum has two equilibrium points. An equilibrium point is a position of the system that if I put it at that state, it'll stay there forever. So if I take a simple pendulum and if I put the mass hanging straight down like that and let go, it'll stay there forever. Likewise, if I have it so the mass is sticking straight up and I get it exactly vertical, whoop, just line it up, just balance it there vertically and I pull away, it'll stay there forever. As long as no one closes any doors or you know, blows on it or does anything that causes it to uh, be disturbed. So this has two equilibrium points. One of them is stable. And that means that if I have it hanging straight down and if I do just give it a tiny little nudge, it'll stay close to its equilibrium point. So that's stable. If it's sticking straight up and I blow on it, even with a mask on, just a tiny little nudge, well, it falls down. So that's unstable. So the simple pendulum has one stable equilibrium point and one unstable equilibrium point. Now the question is, what does this forcing do to that picture? What effect does this have on that? So we're going to start by looking at the theta is equal to zero equilibrium point. We'll, we'll see what happens when we perturb it. 
this equation is called Matthew's equation actually governs that stability problem. So this is not the equation for the position theta. It's the equation for the stability of the system, which is a slightly different question. The thing I want to emphasize is this is a linear equation. It's got a cosine t in it, but that's fine. That's just a known coefficient. The u, the dependent variable, everything's linear. This is what we call a non-autonomous system. Autonomous systems, there's no outside forcing. There's no outside influence on the system. An autonomous system has outside influence. In this case, it's the, the forcing up and down. So that's another distinction that I haven't brought up. It's not actually terribly essential for us is the autonomous versus non-autonomous system. All right, so Matthew's equation. Here's what we're gonna do. I'm first gonna look and primarily look at the stable theta is equal to zero equilibrium point. And I wanna see for different forcing amplitudes and frequencies, can I, for example, could I make my otherwise stable pendulum system unstable by vertical forcing? And you think about that intuitively, you think, no, it's vertical forcing. So all I'm doing is making it go up and down. I can't, this is like patting my head and rubbing my stomach, I can't do it. So this is being forced up and down. This is oscillating back and forth and vertical force, not horizontal forcing, vertical forcing. Could that have any influence on the stability of the pendulum as it's hanging down? You think, nah, intuitively it doesn't make any sense. Well, okay, let's take a look. So again, this is for first for the theta is equal to zero stable case first. We'll look at the sticking straight up case in a moment. All right, so you'll notice there's two terms here. There's a G over L omega squared. So that, ha that has to do with the frequency because it has the omega in it. We're gonna keep this on the same planet. So G is a constant, we'll keep L constant. It's just the same pendulum. And I'm just gonna look at different A's and omegas, different amplitudes and frequencies of vibration. So this term has to do with the frequency of vibration. This term has to do with the amplitude of the vibration. All right, so let's take a look-see. So this is a case where G over L omega squared, that first coefficient is 0.24. And yeah, I picked that number as a special number, but well, it is just, it's just some number, it just looks like a random number. And I plot u as a function of t. And u as a function of t, zero would be hanging straight down. And then u as a function of t is how far does it move from the theta is equal to zero vertical equilibrium point. And so, okay, fine. I, I started at one and it's wobbling back and forth, this high frequency. And then there's this modulation, we call that modulation. Oh my goodness, I got it right on. All that training, connect the dots training I did as a kid came in handy, although the bottom wasn't so good. So there's, it's like a beating effect. So the amplitude is growing and shrinking, growing and shrinking, but it never grows beyond this level. So it's stable. So if I pick a frequency of oscillation such that depending on the planet I'm on and the length of the pendulum, I pick the omega such that this is equal to 0.24, the solution is stable. Okay, well, that makes sense. So again, it's wobbling back and forth. And now the upward motion forcing, all it's doing is causing this modulation, but it's still stable because the overall amplitude is bounded. It never starts just going crazy. What if I choose 0.25 instead of 0.24? So that's the only change I made. Everything's the same. All I did was slightly change the frequency of oscillation, not the amplitude. The amplitude I think I said was one. Well, okay, the amplitude over L is 0.01. So the amplitude is only 1% of the length of the pendulum. So the amplitude, the oscillation, the forcing is only 1% of the total length of the pendulum, so it's, it's relatively small. So the only change I made was to choose a different frequency 
such that now this is equal to a quarter. And now the behavior is completely different. It's now growing with time and it's go going unbounded. So that is an unstable solution. Okay, so think about what just happened. By choosing a particular for vertical forcing frequency, even though it's small amplitude, what I've done is cause my pendulum when it's hanging down to all of a sudden, the amplitude gets bigger and bigger and bigger and it becomes unbounded, it's unstable. So I've made an otherwise stable system unstable just by picking the vertical forcing frequency just right. Let's try 0.26 just to see what happens. So 0.24 stable, 0.25 unstable, 0.26, and you'll see it looks very similar to what we had before. It has this bounded oscillation with, with the beating kind of effect, modulation. So once again, that is stable. So 0.24 is stable, 0 0.2, 0 0.26 is stable, 0.25 is unstable. What's going on? What is the underlying issue? So first of all, we have shown that for a very narrow range of frequencies around a quarter, apparently, we can cause this otherwise stable system to go unstable. Oh, huh, that's kind of cool. The first thing you think of is you think of resonance, right? You think, oh, well, if you force it at the resonant frequency of the system, that's when it goes crazy. This is like the opera singer. Ooh, the opera singer at just the right pitch, which is the natural frequency of the glass, and it shatters the glass. Well, that's resonance. This is not resonance. In order for it to be resonance, I would have had to have done my forcing frequency such that this was one in order for it to match with the frequency of the simple pendulum itself. So that's, well, I should be pointing this one a quarter. So it's not resonance. And again, it's linear. I mean, whenever you see weird behavior and someone asks you, well, why did that happen? You answer Jesus. Uh, I'm sorry. You answer it's nonlinear. That's always the answer. You have weird behavior in your system. Oh, it must be nonlinear. Well, it's not nonlinear in this case. In some cases, that's true. In both of the cases I'll show you next, that is true. And it is the nonlinearity that causes some of the interesting behaviors. However, in this case, it's a linear equation. Okay, so it's not because of nonlinearity, it's not because of resonance. So here's a situation where these are numerical solutions. I got all these solutions in Mathematica, numerical solutions. I try different values, 0 0.24, 0 0.26, 0 0.25, and I get this strange behavior. So what do you do next as a scientist, as an engineer, as a mathematician? Well, of course, the question is, well, why? You go back to being a two-year-old. Why, why, why? Everything is why. Why did that happen? I want to know because I will learn something, hopefully, about the system. It turns out if you do that, and to do that requires some pretty high-level math, uh, graduate level, even PhD level math, which I won't get into, but it turns out there is actually an infinity of tiny little narrow, what we call unstable tongues. So if you think of omega as your parameter at uh, horizontal and A amplitude as your vertical, so if you, as you go out from zero, when you get to a quarter, boom, you get this weird behavior. And it turns out at every time G over L omega squared is N squared over four, where N is an integer, turns out you get another one of those tongues. So the one we were looking at was when N is one. Turns out there's one of these N squared over four for N is equal to zero, one, two, three, four, all the way up to infinity. So we call them unstable tongues. So it's stable, stable, stable. And then and at a quarter, boom, you get a little tongue sticking up that's unstable. Then it goes back to being stable, stable, stable. And then when four over four, which is one hits corresponding to n is equal to two, boom, you get another one. And then three, three squared is nine, nine fourths, boom, you get another tongue. So it turns out there's an infinity of these. Well, that's kind of cool. What about the other case? What about when I have my pen pendulum sticking straight up? All right. So that's a case where it's unstable. All I have to do 
is give it a tiny little nudge and it will fall over. It's unstable. The question is, can I stabilize that using this vertical forcing? And again, you think intuitively, I don't, I don't see how I could. I don't, that doesn't make sense. Now, if I, was, if I had, there is a classic problem of a broom on a cart. And so can you control the cart so it always keeps the broom upright? So it's an inverted pendulum. And the answer is, OK, I, I can intuitively see that that would be possible. If every time it starts falling over, if I quick move my cart kind of underneath it, sure, that makes sense. This is not that. You can find all kinds of YouTube videos on that inverted pendulum problem. This is not that. This is now a pendulum sticking straight up. So similar idea. But now the forcing is only vertical. And you think if it starts to fall off to one side with vertical forcing, there's no way that can bring it back and keep it stable. That doesn't make any intuitive sense at all. Well, the most interesting thing, things in science and engineering is when systems violate your intuition. When that happens, your little antennae bing, should kind of perk up because that's where interesting stuff is, is going to happen. That's when you're going to really learn something about the physics of your system because it's not behaving the way you expect. So therefore, there's something that you don't understand. Your intuition is not matching with reality. So again, the question, can I stabilize my vertical pendulum by forcing it up and down? And the answer is yes. So this is A over L is minus 0.1. G over L omega squared is minus 0 0.001. So the fact that this is negative in both cases means that it's sticking straight up. That's the negative sign. I didn't point it out in my Matthew equation, but here this plus minus corresponds to plus is down, negative is up. So there is a value for a given A over L. There is a value of omega. It's large, which makes G over L omega squared small. That does stabilize it. Here's the plot. This is a numerical solution. This is a real solution of the system. And what's happening is as the system, as the pendulum starts to fall over to one side or the other, if the frequency is just right, again, vertical, not horizontal, if the vertical frequency is just right, I can bring it back. It is a very narrow range of parameters where this will work. Just for very small, uh, uh, relatively small values of G over L omega squared. But here it is. You know, it's doing a little dance here at the peaks. It's kind of trying to decide, should I fall over? Should I stay stable? It's kind of close. It was a close call, but nevertheless, it brings it back. Brings it back, brings it back, brings it back. So it has stabilized an otherwise unstable case. All right, linear ordinary differential equation. All right, don't expect any weird behavior there. Normally, linear equations, you think back to math 252, you either have oscillations, sines and cosines, or you have exponential growth or decay. That's normally what you think of as the, the typical outcome, the solutions of linear ordinary differential equations. Well, this is showing there's a little more to it than that. That's, that's an oversimplification. All right, let's look at the Duffing equation. The Duffing equation is if you have this term, this term, and this term. Okay, the blue and the, is that orange? Yeah, orange terms are gone. That's the Duffing equation. It's a famous equation. We're going to add in damping and forcing. So let me draw kind of a schematic of what we're talking about here. So this is a oscillator problem. So I have a spring like so. I'm going to include a dash pot that will give me my damping. Oh, one thing I, I forgot, I don't remember if I pointed out. You'll notice what's missing in Matthew's equation. There's no mass. The mass doesn't matter. Oh, okay. That's interesting. The length of the pendulum matters. The planet that you put this thing on matters. 
the amplitude and frequency of the forcing matters, but apparently not the mass. Oh, that's interesting. Notice, same thing here. Mass does not come into this equation. Okay, so I have a dash pot, which does the damping. I have a spring, say a spring constant K. I'm also gonna add some nonlinearity with an alpha. If alpha is zero, then it's a linear spring. If alpha is positive or non-zero, then it's a nonlinear spring. So we're gonna have, this is a fun equation to play with because I, I do have damping. I can turn it off, I can turn it on, I can make it bigger, I can make it smaller. There's this nonlinear term, alpha u cubed, u cubed, that's nonlinear, it's not just a u. This term is linear, this term makes it nonlinear. Alpha u cubed. So alpha determines how much the nonlinearity comes in. And then we're also going to force it, just similar to the pendulum. So this is going to be an F cosine cap omega T. So amplitude of the forcing and frequency of the forcing. So kind of have this in mind. And then sometimes I'll turn off the damping. Sometimes I'll turn off the forcing. Sometimes I'll turn off the nonlinearity. And we'll look at different types of solutions depending on different types of situations. So it could be linear, it could be nonlinear, it depends on whether alpha is zero or not. But if it is nonlinear, it comes from nonlinearity in the spring. All right, so this is our forced, our, our duffing equation with damping and forcing. Here's the damping term, the nonlinear term, and the forcing term. D, alpha, and F will determine whether those terms are turned on or turned off. So let me introduce you first to the phase plane. So a phase portrait or the phase plane goes by different names, but it is a plot of the velocity, so u dot, versus the position u, for whatever makes sense in the system. In this case, it is the position of the mass. This is u of t. So as this is wobbling back and forth, if I plot the velocity, which is u dot, the u dt, if I plot that velocity versus the position, u is a function of t, I can plot the trajectory in the phase plane. So this is, the first case is the simplest one. There's no damping, there's no nonlinearity, and there's no forcing. So the only thing left it's u double prime or double dot plus u is equal to zero. What's the solution? Well, that's just a sine or a cosine. It depends on the initial conditions. So it's just oscillating back and forth as a sine wave. We call that a harmonic oscillator. Constant frequency, constant amplitude, and it goes on forever. It's just like the pendulum without any friction. It's just the pendulum goes back and forth forever. So that's what it looks like if you plot u as a function of t. If you plot it as u dot versus u, you get what's called the phase plane. You get the phase portrait of the system. And the trajectory in the phase plane tells you something about the behavior of the system. In this case, this is what's called a limit cycle. A limit cycle means it comes back on itself. It goes through the cycle and it comes back on itself. It has a particular period of oscillation, and then it just keeps repeating, 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 repeating forever, never changes. That's with no damping, no nonlinearity, and no forcing. Okay, so that's the high school physics problem. Now let's upgrade it with some damping. So I'm just gonna turn on the D, add a little bit of damping, still no forcing, still no nonlinearity, and you can see now, as you'd expect, the amplitude of oscillation decreases with time because now you have friction. So same thing as with the pendulum. If you include friction, eventually the oscillation amplitude will keep getting smaller and smaller and smaller and tend towards zero. In the phase plane, you're starting here at t is equal to zero. And as you evolve in time, it's spiraling inward towards the origin. If it reaches the origin, it's not moving. Okay, all I did was turn on damping. 
and that's what you get. Now that's still a linear equation. I could still solve that exactly in math 252. Still linear constant coefficient equation. What if I add some forcing now? So now no damping, I'm gonna turn off the damping, keep the nonlinearity off still, and just add a tiny bit of forcing. My apologies, I couldn't hear what you said. Oh, the other night I couldn't sleep. So I was up late watching YouTube videos. And so one of them was a comedian, actually I think it was Charlie Barron's, was talking about uh, Siri. And so then of course, all of my Siri enabled devices late at night start asking, well, I can't understand what you're saying, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, oh brother, this is so annoying. Anyway, so sorry, Siri, didn't mean to confuse you. So again, So no damping, <clears throat> no nonlinearity, and I think I already said this, a small amount of forcing. That's the only difference. What we're gonna do though, is we're gonna force it at the natural frequency of the system itself, which corresponds to capital omega is one. So capital omega is the natural frequency. So I'm gonna force it at the natural frequency. As you would expect, this is like the opera singer, the oscillation amplitude gets bigger and bigger and bigger until the glass breaks. So now it's starting here at t is equal to zero in the phase plane and it's spiraling out as the amplitude gets bigger and bigger and bigger. That is resonance. That truly is resonant behavior. Solution is growing in time because I'm forcing it at the frequency, natural frequency of the system. And so that tiny little nudge every time makes it get bigger, bigger, bigger until it blows up. I didn't get that. Again. Now let's try adding in a little bit of nonlinearity. So same as the previous case. So no damping, no damping, small amount of forcing, forcing at the natural frequency. But now I'm going to add in just a little bit of nonlinearity. Boom. I broke the resonance. So just a tiny little bit of forcing, sorry, tiny little bit of nonlinearity is enough to break the resonance. It's completely gone. It no longer grows with time. Now you kind of get this beating, you get this beating effect. The modulation we talked about before. In the phase plane, you can see this kind of interesting pattern on the right. As it's going in, coming out, going in, coming out and it does that forever. Well, this is fun. And I'm just getting started. I haven't gone to gotten to the fun stuff yet. Now we want to get to the fun stuff. I want to show you chaos. Actual real true chaos. Not that kind of colloquial version of chaos where it's like the bulls in the fourth quarter. Chaos. I'm not talking about that type of chaos. We're not talking about the chaos going on in Minneapolis. We're not talking about the chaos that's going on in my household right now, probably. We're talking about actual mathematical deterministic, what's called deterministic chaos. Deterministic means it's coming from the equations themselves. Chaos makes it sound like it's random, but it's not. It's deterministic chaos. It's a, it's a chaos. It's a strange, unusual behavior, chaotic type behavior, but it's coming out of the equations. It's not just coming out of nowhere. So the idea will be as follows. We're going to keep the damping small. There will be damping, but I'm going to keep it small. But I'm going to play with the forcing amplitude. So I'm going to keep the damping small at 0.1. I'm going to keep the nonlinearity at 5. I'm going to keep the frequency of, us, of forcing at 1.4, so it's not at the natural frequency anymore. So there's no resonance in anything I'm going to show you. And I'm just going to increase the amplitude F. I'm going to start off small and get bigger and bigger and bigger. Everything else is exactly the same. The damping, nonlinearity, and frequency of vibration. Okay, well, that was oversold. So this is an F of 0.1. There's some initial transients where it's kind of going up and down, but if you kind of cut it off at about here, and just look at how it's proceeding and progressing forward in time, it looks like a limit cycle solution. And it is. 
So if I don't include this part in my phase portrait and I just start it from here, I get typical limit cycle behavior. All right, well, that was oversold. Well, let's increase F a little bit more. To do this and to illustrate the solutions, I'm gonna introduce another way of looking at the solution. That's called the Poincaré section. Again, French, it's not the Poincaré section, it's the Poincaré, Poincaré. Henri, not Henry, Henri, Henri Poincaré. Yeah, work on your French castle. All right, so this is a, called a Poincaré section. The best way to describe it is it's a uh, face plane, but with a strobe light. Oh, you guys aren't from the 70s. You don't know what a strobe light is. Strobe light goes on and off, so you can only see the system when the light is on. When it's off, obviously, you can't see it. So you have a phase plane. So you have the trajectory, whatever's happening in the phase plane, but we're gonna just take a snapshot at particular frequencies. We're just gonna turn the light on at prescribed frequencies. And then the Poincaré section gives you a dot. Where is the trajectory of the system at that particular time? You get a dot. You don't see how it got there. You don't see what it does afterwards. All you see is the dot. So, well, I'll show you a picture in a second. The frequency of the strobe light will be related to the forcing frequency. There's two frequencies in the problem. One is the natural frequency of vibration of the harmonic oscillator, which just depends on the mass and the spring and so forth. The other frequency is the, for, is the forcing frequency. So you can pick one or the other. We're gonna pick the forcing frequency because as I increase F, that's going to become the dominant frequency. When there is no forcing, of course, there's only one frequency, and that's the natural frequency of, of the system. But once you increase the forcing enough, that will be the dominant one. So we're going to take a picture every time 2 pi over cap omega. All right, so here's the simple case that I just showed you a moment ago. So this is a limit cycle solution. I'm going to take a picture of where that trajectory is at every 2 pi over cap omega. And it will always be at the same point right there. So the way to think about it is you have your trajectory. This is still u dot versus u. So it's going around in the phase plane. But I'm only going to record where it was at these particular frequencies when I turn on the strobe light. Boom, that's where it is, put a dot there. Next one, take a picture, that's where the dot is. In this case, the dot's at the same point every time because the period of oscillation is the same. In other words, the, this period is the same as the forcing frequency. So I only get one dot. There's only one period in my solution. So the number of dots, equals the number of periods in the solution. Great. Let's increase it to f is equal to 10. If I plot u as a function of t, and you'll notice again, after I, you know, after some period of time, it's kind of a regular pattern. If I chop off this stuff at the beginning and just do my, my phase plane plot, you'll see it's kind of got these two loops. So there's two periods embedded in the solution was one for f equals 0.1 and now it's 10. f equals 10 it's got two periods. If I do the Poincaré section I now have two dots. So as it comes around and I take a picture it's either at this dot or it's this dot and that corresponds to it's either on this loop or it's on this loop. So there's two periods. So we've gone through what's called a period doubling for obvious whoops for obvious reasons yeah well don't show that yet castle Woo! didn't mean to scare anybody so we went from one period to two periods period doubling okay that was fun let's increase f to 100 again everything else is exactly the same nothing different same damping same nonlinearity. everything's exactly the same all i'm doing frequency of, of forcing is the same all i'm doing is increasing the amplitude of the forcing I'm going to jump it all the way up to 100. 
Now you can see, okay, things are getting a little more interesting. The phase plane plot is, again, more interesting. It looks chaotic. There's no longer a clear, definable number of periods, distinguishable periods. It looks like chaos. So if we just stop there, and if I keep increasing F and I just keep showing you plots like this and this, it's really hard, it's really hard to make any sense of it. They're just going to be messy, increasingly messy plots. But if I show you the Poincaré section, drum roll, please. <gasps> what? That's a little more than two. So we start off with one period, then two periods, and now I've got, I actually don't remember how many I used to count. It's thousands. There are thousands of dots. So every time it came around and I took the strobe light picture, the dot was at a different place. But notice, based on this behavior, I would expect my Poincaré section to just be a red mess, just red dots sprinkled all over the phase plane. But it's not. It's this actually rather beautiful structure. So you'll notice as it keeps coming around and I take my strobe light picture, the dots tend to fall in certain regions of the phase plane. We call that an attractor. So an attractor is the portion of the phase plane where the solution tends to get attracted. So whatever initial conditions I start out with, it tends to work its way towards this portion of the phase plane. The strange part of it, this is actually strange in a strange attractor sense, actually as a technical mathematical definition, the strange part of it is because it's chaotic. So all systems have attractors. So a limit cycle solution is actually an attractor. That's the one point in phase space where it tends to want to find itself. But this is chaotic, which makes it more interesting. And that's why I have so many red dots, but it's now chaotic. If I zoom way in, you can see all of these structures are actually comprised of a whole bunch of dots. Some of them are a little bit more wispy, fewer dots. Some of them have, you know, they, they, they come around to that position or close to that position more regularly. But it has this beautiful behavior. So this now is my strange attractor. And you can see even inside, there's regions where it never seems to come. So that's kind of cool. So let's focus in on, I'm gonna zoom in on this portion right here. All the, it's the same, same Poincaré section. All I'm gonna do is zoom in. That's what you see. So now you can see a little bit more of the individual dots. The point is I've zoomed in significantly, but it kind of looks the same. I still see these, these regions where there's lots of dots regions where there's very few dots and regions where there's no dots. If I zoom in even more, uh, I think I'm gonna zoom in, if I remember right, I think it's about here. If I zoom in on that portion, that's what it looks like. Yep, I got the right spot right here. I zoom in again, same idea. If I just gave you these three, well, two, these two, I mean, this, this one obviously is showing the whole thing as you can see the, the boundaries of the strange attractor. If I showed you this one or this one, you'd be hard pressed to tell me which one is zoomed in more than the other. This is called a fractal. So fractal behavior is when you have the same or basically the same type of structures on different scales. So, you know, there's fractals in nature. If you look at the the leaves, you know, the structures of leaves. If you look at the coastline uh, on a beach, if you look at uh, many different things in nature, they look basically the same on different scales. So those are called fractals. So this is, this is fractal behavior that comes from a nonlinear, it is nonlinear, a nonlinear system 
that has this chaotic behavior. So these things go together. Chaos, fractals, and strange attractors go together. Can't have one without the other. Now there's another type of diagram, which I'll, I'll walk us quickly through. It's called a bifurcation diagram. A bifurcation in a system is values of the parameters for which the system goes through some qualitative change. It might go from one period to two periods. That would be a bifurcation. It might go from stable to unstable. That would be a bifurcation. It might go from a finite number of periods to an infinite number of periods. That would be a bifurcation. So a bifurcation diagram shows how the solution is changing with, in this case, the parameter F. The horizontal axis is F going from 60 to 150. And then this is U. So all of these dots are showing you, the way I generated this was I pick different Fs and I say, okay, for this particular F, what are the U's? What are the possible U's? In this case, there's only one. There's only one solution, it's right there. For this value of F, it looks like there might be three. If I zoom in, there's actually more, it's actually four, but uh, so there's two here and two here. If I pick this F, which I'll show you in a moment, I'll zoom in on this region, you'll see there's more. If I zoom in on this region, which I'll show you in a moment, there's a whole bunch, but then it kind of cleans up as I increase F, it goes from multiple solutions here, four to eight to 16, 32. That's the period doubling I was talking about. Then it becomes chaotic for a range of Fs. And then it all of a sudden cleans up. Let me show you that. So I'm gonna show you this portion right here. Just zoom in on that portion right there. So you can see it's gone from, this upper branch has gone from one solution here and it's bifurcated into four. Then this one bifurcates into two, this one bifurcates into two, eventually these two bifurcate into two, and then four, eight, 16, 32, period doubling. And then all of a sudden for a particular value of F, it goes chaotic. But then all of a sudden magically, you keep increasing the amplitude of, of vibration forcing, and all of a sudden it kind of cleans itself up. It's still kind of messy in here, but it's nowhere near as messy as this was. Now, if you looked at this closely, look at that. That's not a mistake. It looks like some of my red dots just kind of got tired and fell off the plot. What happened was all of a sudden for a particular value of F, it went from having a whole mess of solutions back to having just one. It's like we're way back down here again. So messy, kind of messy, but not terribly, kind of cleans itself up, then period doubling, period doubling, period doubling, chaos, not so much chaos, chaos, and then all of a sudden, boom, we're back down to one period again. For Fs, I think this is like 148 this starts. I think I said it someplace. Yeah, 148. So start at 148, it goes back to just one solution, one period. Pretty cool. So I've introduced you to phase planes, Poincaré sections, and bifurc bifurcation diagrams. These are all tools that we use to enlighten, expose, reveal qualitative behavior and sometimes quantitative behavior that's embedded in these very complicated systems. Now, just wait till we get to PDEs. These are still ODs. All right, so we'll stop there next time after the exam. So you'll be in suspense until after the exam. We'll talk about the Saltzman Lorenz model, nonlinear with all kinds of crazy, wild, chaotic behaviors. We'll do that next time. All right. Ooh, let's check the chat. Stock recommendation? No. If you don't know the number, how do you go about exactly? That's exactly the problem. If you don't know the number, how do you go about picking it? Yes. Yes. 
yes. So the question is for the exam, do we know how need to do we need to know how to use Lagrange multipliers? And the answer is yes. So you use a Lagrange multiplier when you have a constraint. You have a cost or an objective function that you want to minimize. And then you use, use Lagrange multiplier when you have a constraint on that. So yes, you do need to know how to do that. Yep. No, right. That's it. Right. I'm glad you brought that up. So there was a homework problem that required integrating factors. You are not, I'm not going to ask you to do anything heroic like that. Not that it's terribly heroic, but I'm not going to ask you to do anything heroic like that on the exam. Yeah, you're examining, I'm not examining you on your ability to do esoteric integrating factor types of methods. So that's right. That won't be on your exam. Correct. Oh, also, will you be sending out another? No, I answered that last time. Nice try, though. No, so you already have now have two sample exams, sample exam one and actual exam one. So we went through a period doubling of sample exams. We do not need any more sample exams. So no. Oh, Castle, you're so just 